I'm Mel Stewart, and this is Swim Slam Podcast. Joining me today is somebody I've wanted to talk to for a while. This is going to be a really special moment. We've got just a little bit of time. She is dropping in from her stomping grounds where she's working right now. We have an, we have an NC State distant swimmer, alum, deep roots in the sport. We have deep, we have deep connections in the sport. She's also the NBC News Capitol Hill, Capitol Hill correspondent, Leanne Caldwell. Perfect. I, I screwed it up. No, I screwed it up, didn't I? It was perfect. We like to bring in personalities uh, to Swim Swam so that a lot of kids will understand a lot of swimmers who are age groupers or in college they're thinking about their careers. We want them to know that, that their future can be bright if they bring that same hard work and skill set to their careers, something that you've done. So I'm just going to hit you right over the head and just say, Hey, you've got the skill set. Why aren't you covering the Olympic games? Um, <laughs> I can't believe you started with that. Well, usually the Olympic games are in an election year and I cover politics. But this year, Mel, they are not in an election year. So maybe my bosses are listening and they'll think I'd be perfect to cover the Olympic Games. We think that you would be fantastic to cover the Olympic Games. So this, there's a lot of media out there and lots of times it will lead with saying, hey, you've got this background. And this was something you did consider when you were building your career. Was it, was it really a consideration? You know, I'd like to, I'd like to, be, I'd like to be covering the Olympics. I Absolutely. Actually, the reason I got into journalism is because of the Olympics. I was 10 years old, watching Bob Costas narrate swimming. I was a swimmer, and I didn't necessarily have big dreams of going to the Olympics for swimming, but I did as a reporter, as a broadcaster. And so that is actually the reason I got into journalism. And as I got older, you know, I kind of switched and I fell in love with politics, but yeah, the Olympics is in sports, excuse me, is a huge, huge goal of mine. So let's go back to the beginning. That's a perfect segue. You brought up when you were a 10 year old kid. So when you were a 10 year old kid, where were you swimming? I was swimming at the Las Vegas gold. Yes. <laughs> so you, uh, just, uh, so I was there. I, I swam at Las Vegas Gold. I swam with David Marsh. Were you? Were you actually? Were you in in uh, Bob Co Bob 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 Bowman's crew? Because yes, Bowman was the I was age group coach Bowman's for a while. Crew. Yep. You were. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Because yes. people like Bob. Here's the thing. I wasn't swimming for a long time. I came back to swimming, and Bob Bowman was. You know, he was sort of like the god of coaching because he had Michael Phelps. And my yeah. image of Bob was walking in and seeing Bob, you know, coaching the age group swimmers. And I was like, he's a, he's, a, he's an age group coach. Totally. He was my age group coach. Yes. What, was, yeah. he good, was he a good age group coach? Yes, absolutely. He was a fantastic age group coach. He and Carrie, it was Bob and Carrie who were the age group coaches. And yeah, he coached me for like two and a half years, two years. Oh, that's, I think that, I think age group coaches are sacred in our careers. I think that they're, they're very meaningful. And uh, so have you, have you talked to him since then? Um, just on Facebook every now and again, every few years, every, we send each other, you know, great job, congratulatory notes. And that's about it. I've been watching his success and he's been done so great. Bob is, um, you know, swimming is so small and it's, it's like, if we, d if you don't know anyone, you, you know, you know, somebody who everybody else knows, there's always, you're always like one person that's a connection away. Absolutely. I, I just love that art that, you know, here's the thing I was, I remember walking in. So I was there when we would do our like dry land training and I'd walk in the age groupers are doing it. So you were a little kid and you were there. I was totally there. I never missed swim practice. I was totally there. <laughs> Did you, did, did you know you were a distance swimmer when you were a little kid? Sadly, yes. I never wanted to be a distance swimmer. <laughs> but Mel, I have no speed. I can go forever. I just, the longer, the better. I have no speed. 
I, I, you, you have a great pedigree, you have great roots, you have great connections in the sport. This is all good stuff for, for, you know, for, uh, for name dropping for the Olympic games in 2021, cause they're going to happen, but totally. uh, let's, let's move on. So you, you, um, you know, you, you, you had a great career because you went on and swam D1 and for 99% of, of the swimming community, swimming in college D1 is it, that's the gold medal. Yeah. And, uh, and you did that and you swam at NC state. What was, what was your NC state experience like? So NC state, it was a while ago. Um, we were good. We weren't, we weren't how, as great as they were now. Um, you know, we were mid ACC level, not the worst, not the best, but I mean, it was intense. It was any D1 swimming, you know, competitive life. It was love hate relationship. It was hard. It was exhausting. It was frustrating, maddening, but it was also like the greatest love of mine. It was something I couldn't hang up and you know, it really did. It's funny because it set me back in some ways academically, but it really gave me these skills and this commitment and this motivation that have just like, and this determination and this ability to get through anything that that has gone way farther than anything else and for the rest of my life. Well, you're, you're being humble, obviously, and in, in, in a few different ways. But the, so you are, you also, this, you know, I would say that your era, your period of time in NC State was the genesis for the reboot because NC State was great in the seventies. And then, yeah. then uh, and, and now it's, you know, there's a, this is a Renaissance period. NC State is back because of a teammate. Were you yeah. friends with Braden Holloway when you guys were swimming? Absolutely. We were all friends, like the wholesome team. We were super close and I was, I was, yes, I was friends with him and his wife, Mary. We, you know, we were at swim practice five hours a day together and hung out Saturday nights together as a team and our one night to go out. And, you know, we, it, yeah, we were, we were all super close. He was a year behind you, right? Yeah. 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 So he, he was, and he Mary was, were both a year behind me. They were, they were kids. You were so senior to them. I'm, totally. I'm, totally. The t- are you, so just, uh, I don't, I, I want this to be about you, but I do have to ask, you know, seeing what, what he's done at NC state, um, cause they're, you know, NC state's a powerhouse always in contention now at the NC two A yeah. level. How does that feel as an alum? I'm so proud. I am so proud of what Braden has been able to do with his team. Every time I talk to him, I'm like, what is your secret? What do you do? How did you do it? And a couple of years ago, I went and talked to the girls team at the beginning of the season. I was kind of their like motivational speaker and so I got to spend a lot of time with Brayden and the coaches and it's just, he's just created such a great environment and such a great environment for winning, but also camaraderie. And he's just built such a great program. I'm super proud of him. And if we traveled back in time and you were that senior swimmer to Brayden and, and you, and you looked at him and someone whispered in your ear and said, he's going to be the new head coach and they're going to be great when he's the new head coach. Would you have believed it? Actually, probably would have. Like it was always like, yeah, Brayden would, I was not shocked that Brayden became a coach and I'm actually not shocked with him being a great coach. His, he had his level of intensity he had as a swimmer too. He was just intense about so much and, um, and that has carried him so well. I didn't expect him to come back to NC state. I mean, it's perfect homecoming for him and I'm so happy he did. So we're, we're post swimming. And it's uh, your, your, your thoughts were, you know, I, 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 you were inspired by Bob Costas and his coverage, which a great journalist covering sports uh, and, and just an icon doing it for decade after decade. I could see why there would be an interest with your sports background, but you, you moved into politics. What was yeah. the crossroads? What was, what was that moment where you go, I'm going this way? So it was in college, actually. I took a bunch of poli sci classes as my minor and I loved it. And then I had this moment in college where I was like, maybe I want to do politics instead of journalism. And I couldn't decide. And so my first job, I, when I was in college, I went to school for four and a half years. So that last semester when I wasn't swimming, I was able to like explore the world. So I got an internship at the local TV station 
And then upon graduation, I was like, maybe I want to try politics out for a minute. And so I moved to Washington and I was actually a staffer for a member, for a senator on the Hill for a couple of years. And that was the moment. And a few months into that, I was like, ah, I think I need to do journalism. <laughs> and so now I have this like perfect combination of covering politics as a journalist. So I got to combine these two loves of mine. Um, and so, yeah, it was kind of in college where I just realized that like politics was another kind of sport that I wanted to be involved in in some way. It seems like the ultimate sport. <laughs> it, <is. laughs> yes. it does. I mean, yes, it, it's, it's a unique thing. If, if it, Increasingly, if you haven't been engaged in politics, of course, you have been sent, you know, from, the, from Obama to the Trump administration, Things have gotten very, very frothy. And, and I know in trying to get you to come on, it, it sounds like you're extraordinarily busy. Uh, can, you, can you draw some parallels between your current career and your SWIM and how SWIM has benefited you as a correspondent? Yeah, um, there's so many ways. Not only, of course, time management, obviously. Um, you know, as a swimmer, as all you swimmers who are listening know that you have to do things to get things done. There's not a lot of time to be able to waste. My parents now told me that that was the plan. That was their plan all along so that I was too busy to get into any trouble and it worked. Um, so there's not only the time management component that does stay with you um, because my job is, you know, it's constant. It's just constant. Um, but there's a lot of other things that have really stayed with me as well. And this is a weird one, but it's like learning how to fail, like knowing how to deal with failure, which is something that I dealt with as a swimmer all the time, like not making a meet, not making my goal and not making my cut. Um, and as a journalist too, like if I get scooped by another reporter or I don't get the job that I want or put on the, assignment that I want or whatever it is, um, I really feel like I have been able that that is one of the biggest lessons that swimming has taught me is like how to come back from failure, however big or small that failure was. You are, wow, that's interesting. So it, it, from the outside looking in, it, it feels like if you're a capital Hill correspondent, you're, you're, this is the first draft of history and you're giving it orally, you're doing it. Um, but it's always that you're trying to, to get that information. It's based on relationships. Uh, yeah. That sounds daunting. Well, I tell my kids this. Um, I say my job is to gossip all day. And then I tell everyone <laughs> about what I learned. <laughs> so I think it's, I mean, for me, it's super fun. Um, I love it, but it's also it's stressful. There's a lot of pressure. We can't be wrong, especially in today's environment. We just cannot be wrong. Um, and so if you're first, it's not only exhilarating because you have information first, but it's also scary because no one else has it. So you doubt yourself a lot. Um, so there's all sorts of emotions that go into it, but also this deep sense of responsibility of like, you are the first draft of history. And if you get it wrong, then you just have to, it, it's just not good is an understatement, but um, it's important to remember the role that you have and that it is pretty critical, um, especially at an organization like NBC where so many people looked at NBC. I have always looked at NBC even before I looked, worked here as like the premium in journalism and news gathering. And you have to live up to that name too. Uh, so in reading into your background, I saw some interesting things that, that, that kind of hit home and, and probably hit home for a lot of people personally. Um, and I can bottom line it as an example. I have a pre-existing condition. I'm on Obamacare. And uh -huh. I read into your background the dramatic moment when the, you know, we thought that the Republican Party was going to just roll that back. And we, it was came down to that one dramatic vote. I think it was 
you know, the, the, the vote was at like at one in the morning. Was that correct? But yeah, it, it was. Something yeah. happened. You were there. You were present. Can you unpack that story for me? Sure. Should I start from the beginning? Well, I could, I'll, I'll, I'll start from the beginning um, as far as earlier in the night. It was um, about 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night, at night, and we knew that the vote was going to be late, and I knew I wasn't going to see my young kids that day, so I had FaceTimed them, and I was just standing outside the Senate chamber in the Capitol in these beautiful halls, FaceTiming my children, and Senator John McCain walks up. And it was the first time I had seen him since he had gotten back from his terminal brain cancer diagnosis. He had only been back in Washington for two days. And he said, hi, Leanne, how are you? And I said, hi, Senator, so good to see you. And I have my kids on FaceTime. And I was like, I'm FaceTiming my children who he had never met, probably didn't even know I had children. And he's like, oh, let me see. And he starts talking to them. And they're little at this, very little, you know, two and five or three and six or something. And um, he said, was making all these funny faces at them and just being a very like grandfatherly person. And then he turned to me and said, don't ever stop taking pictures of your children. It goes by way too fast. And it's actually something that I have to think about on a weekly basis because I do not think to take pictures of my children. So I carry that with me forever. So the night progresses. We still didn't know how the Obamacare repeal vote would turn out. We knew there were two senators, Collins and Murkowski, two women who were going to uphold it, but they needed that third Republican in order for that vote to fail, to overturn Obamacare. And it was the dramatic moment when Senator McCain, everyone had voted, walks into the room, and he just does a thumbs down, meaning I'm voting no. I'm not going to overturn Obamacare. All the air was let out in the room. He just, he saved his former rival's signature achievement, health care, um, the Affordable Care Act. And he did it because he thought it was the right thing to do. He just had this, this terminal diagnosis of brain cancer. Um, he was struggling with that decision and he saved the Affordable Care Act. And as reporters, we're not allowed on the Senate floor. So I was outside the Senate chamber with a bunch of other reporters. The first and out comes Senator John McCain. He's the, I'm the first person he sees. He walks up and not to talk to me, just to walk out of the chamber. And I catch up with them and I'm like, Senator, how do you feel? You just upheld President Obama's signature achievement. He turns to look at me and he says, how do I feel? That is the stupidest question I've ever heard in my life. How do I feel? <laughs> he says, and then he goes on to say, ask a better question next time. And then by that time, like and other reporters were like started sh shouting questions at him. And so he didn't ask my question except for to tell me that it was the stupidest question. But that was like, there's two points there. The, the many faces of John McCain and never ask a POW survivor how he feels. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's easy to get caught up in moments and it's easy to, to ask that question because yes, that was such a dramatic moment that it, it, I could see, I could see why you would organically just say, how do you feel? And, uh, but your heart must have sunk and, and yeah. oh my God, what, what, a, what, a, what whiplash after he had this, he had this grandfatherly moment with him earlier in the evening. Totally, totally. But that's also gets to the point of like how the relationship with the press and members of Congress is like, we have to we have to build relationships with these people. But we also know that our role is to hold these people accountable, and to ask them questions that they might not like, even though that was kind of a fluffy question, but like, in other times, ask them questions that they don't like or say things that they're not going to like about them on television or write things about them that as long as we are fair and there's justification for what we're doing and we have the reporting behind it, then it's,
it tends to be fair game um, because it is our job to hold these people accountable. They have a lot of power and it can't go unscripted basically. We're running down our time because you've got to get back to work pretty soon and you can call it at any moment because we're going to take every second we can possibly get. You just have to cut. That's a few more minutes. I'm good. There is something I wanted to ask you. You know, it seems like in swimming, everybody experiences one moment where they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm, I'm, it's so hard. If you're a swimmer and you survive through a swimming career, you, you're, you're like a little bit of a superhero. You know, you, you made it. It's, you're tough. But there's that moment when you don't want to do it. Did you have that moment in swimming? And have you had that moment in your career? It might have been when John McGain gave you whiplash. I don't yeah. know. I've had that. I had that moment several times during swimming. Um, once, especially, I wouldn't say once, but one time frame in high school, when I was a junior in high school, it was the first half of my junior year. Um, you know, my coach was really, really tough on me, like, really hard. I would even argue brutally hard, unnecessarily hard. Um, and I wanted to quit. Um, it was, you know, at the beginning of the recruiting season and I just wanted to be done with it. Um, I stuck it out. I stuck it out because I knew that college was close and that if I could get there, I could do it. Um, and then I had the same thing again in college too. Uh, my freshman year was fine. Um, but my sophomore and junior years were, were hard again. You know, I again had a coach, maybe it's me, but I again had a coach who was really, really tough on me. Um, and, and I just wasn't sure if it was worth it or not. Um, but I stuck it out and I am so happy I did. Um, nothing worth it is easy. It's hard. Um, and my senior year, it was my senior year. I had an attitude change too. Like I knew it was my last year. Don't take it too seriously. And I stopped stressing about it so much and I swam better. I had my best year of my entire career. I trained best. I like everything was just better partially because of my own attitude toward my relationship with swimming. Um, and then in my, my professional careers, I almost quit in my late twenties. I wasn't getting to where I wanted to be. I couldn't get the jobs that I wanted. Um, I just wasn't sure if I was meant to do it, if things weren't working out for me. Um, but again, I, I kind of stuck with it and it took me longer than it takes most people, but it worked out. I think in your late twenties, it's a, it's a tough time. People say midlife crisis is tough, but I didn't experience a midlife crisis. My late twenties was a, a transitional period, a lot of questioning and a period yeah. of like depression and like really just uncertainty. And I think that that's common. Um, it, so- yeah. it sounds like, it sounds like what you, what you've achieved has been hard fought. It, yeah, it has not come easy. I will say, um, you know, it's yeah. And nothing good does come easy, but yeah, it's been, it, it hasn't been handed to me. That's for sure. Okay. I'm just going to, I'm just going to throw you out there to the wolves. Have you been in the pool? Have you been swimming? Oh gosh, no. I think the last time I swam was, well, sometimes I'll do like a couple laps, but the last time I swam for real, like actually did a practice was when I was pregnant with my first kid. And that was eight years ago. It's been a while. <laughs> was I at that practice? Was that the master's practice that I was at? The one you were at. <laughs> I was at a master's practice with, uh, with USA Swimming. I think we, we dropped in and, and did one, which was great. And yeah. with, with an old friend, are you, are you friends with Barb Shykoff? I mean, since I don't swim anymore, I don't see her often, but I see her you know, at least once a year and I go to like the old swim team parties and everyone's well, pre COVID anyway. Um, yeah. So I see her every once in a while or I'm in touch on social media. She's fantastic. Okay. We're, we're winding down just a few minutes after recap Las Vegas gold swam with Bob Bowman. Yeah. NC state was a senior swimmer to Braden Holloway. Who's now leading NC state into the, the, the upper echelons of D one swimming and okay. master master swimming with Barb Shykoff who was one of the most pivotal people in 
in the Olympic movement for athletes' rights and athletes having the the right to earn money. So yeah. it feels like you're always at the right place in the sport of swimming, but you're not covering the Olympic Games. Maybe I'll be in the right place this year. <laughs> I think this thing, the stars are aligning for you. Are there any parting thoughts that you have? Anything you'd like to share? Um, well, first, I'm so happy you asked that, that this was able to work out. Um, always love coming to talk to about my swimming. And it is just such a pivotal part of my life is helped it, it is who I am I don't swim anymore but it's just like built my character it's built my view on the world it's um and swimmers are just amazing people let's just put it out there <laughs>